I'd like to thank Ruth McWhite and Steve Krause for the opportunity to be here today. It is indeed a pleasure to share with this wonderful institution that is dedicated to raising up the next generation of Christians to impact this world for Christ. My husband is here with me today. Would you please stand, honey? Dr. Alton Brandt, a professor who has to soon leave to give an exam at Clemson University. But my husband and I would agree on this that most of your parents are pee-picking proud that you have chosen such a place to get your education. And in a few weeks when some of you walk across that stage to get that diploma, if you notice a smile on your parents' faces that is there for months and you can't wipe it away, it's because your graduation is their graduation. Oh, we're the parents of three sons. And when that last son walked across the stage, we were clapping more than most. And I mean that smile and that joy didn't go away for quite some time. It was our graduation also from college tuition payments. <laughs> we're going to talk about success today because after all, is that not why you're here? And we're going to start by looking at a definition of, from Webster's def, uh, dictionary about success up here. And success is basically the attainment of honor, wealth, position, and the accomplishment of one's goals. And Webster says that it's a noun. But where does our faith play into our goals and successes? And to start today, I'm going to start with a story about a teacher. Of course, my husband and I love teachers because we've been teachers for 30 to 40 years. And this teacher asked her students to bring something to class that represented what was important to them, like a show and tell. Now, the Jewish boy brought his kippah cap. The Catholic girl brought her rosary beads. Of course, the Muslim boy brought his prayer rug. You want to guess what the little Baptist girl brought? Anyone? Macaroni and cheese. Oh, yes, she did. She brought that macaroni and cheese. And if I had been in that class as a student, I think I would have brought my perfect attendance Sunday school pins. Am I dating myself? But even though I grew up in a Baptist church like most of you from the cradle rolls, it took me a while to realize that Christianity is so much more than attending church doing good works, eating that macaroni and cheese. And it took my father, Harry Dent, quite a bit longer. You see, I grew up in the halls of power of our nation's capital because my father served a senator and three presidents. Oh, we were among the privileged who got to go to White House dinners and events. We got to sit in the Kennedy Center in the president's box for concerts. I actually flew on Air Force One with President Richard Nixon and his wife, and we met important, and here's that word again, successful people. And about the same time we were getting to do all these wonderful things, I achieved that goal from Webster's of my life. I was offered the opportunity at age 16 to model with the top modeling agency in New York City, the Eileen Ford Agency. Oh, my dad and I were on top of the world. And there was that day when I thought that that modeling opportunity was the most important and most successful day of my life. And there was the day when my father thought the greatest and most important day of his life was the day that he raised his right hand to promise to serve the President of the United States Richard Nixon. By the world standards, we had achieved Webster's definition of success. But now in looking back, boy, did we have a lot to learn about God and what he thinks is important. Oh, I now know without a doubt, my greatest day came the day I realized that I needed a savior. And I learned 
that God had a plan, a specific plan for my life, just as he does each one of you. And yes, I grew up in a wonderful family, the Harry Dent family. I was taught good morals and good character and church attendance. And we were busily paving our way to heaven with our good works while sipping that sweet tea and eating that macaroni and cheese. And then I read my Bible and I realized, oh my goodness, I can't get to heaven on my good works. They're only as good as filthy rags. And that's when I surrendered my life to Jesus Christ and began to walk in a new direction and to a new definition of success. And it was more than that macaroni and cheese. My father was quite concerned at the time because he thought I was leaving all these successful things I had done. He thought I was drinking too much of the Kool-Aid, if you know what I mean. And he was throwing obstacles in my path to stop me because he loved me and thought I was moving in the wrong direction. Yes, this gal had a different definition of success, different from my father's. And I was just beginning to see what God thought was important. One baby step at a time. Now, after my spiritual transformation, my boyfriend also gave his life to Christ, and he left his business major at the University of South Carolina to transfer to Columbia International University, a school very much like this, to get his Christian worldview education. Now, when he did that, my father told him he would never have my hand in marriage. After all, to go to such a place was not exactly his definition of a successful son-in-law. So a year later, when I told my dad, you know what, Dad, I feel God's leading me to go there too. Oh, he was not happy at all. He summoned us to his back porch. He shook his finger in our face and he said, you too will never be anything more than two church mice who nibble off of government cheese. And you will never be a success in this world. And then he looked straight at me and he said, Jenny Dent, I'll pay for your brother to go to Harvard University. And he did, all expenses paid. I'll pay for your sister to go to Furman University. And he did. But I will not pay for you to go to such a place. You are on your own. Ouch. <laughs> it's not easy saying no to a father who advises presidents. And a man who secretly feared that if I went to CIU, I might end up something gosh awful like a missionary. Oh, God forbid. Wouldn't that be horrible? Again, still putting everything in my path to block me. And the first day I went to classes at CIU, I cried the entire way there. This compliant, card-carrying daddy's girl was torn deep inside between my earthly father and my heavenly father. But I knew I must follow the leading and higher calling of my heavenly father. And in the midst of my tears that day, the Lord brought this verse to comfort my heart, my life verse, Matthew 6, 33. And it says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. And that gave me the comfort to know if I did what God was calling me to do, he would meet my financial needs and he would take care of my concerns for my father and my family. Now, my new definition of success put me living in what many people would call poverty, but I had everything I needed, and I got what I so desperately wanted. A Christian education from God's point of view, and I would not trade that for anything in this world. My boyfriend and I were later married, and my father finally gave his permission 
and my parents gave us some wonderful wedding gifts to wish us well. But my dad gave us one wedding gift that was kind of odd. You'll see it pictured here. It was a painting of a shack in the woods. Just that subtle manipulative. When your dad's a politician, you're going to be manipulated too. Just keep that in mind. That reminder that if we continued to go this direction, we would live in nothing more than a shack for the rest of our lives. Oh, my goodness. My only power was on my knees. I couldn't control anything. Only God can control things. And I prayed and prayed and prayed. And some days I was discouraged. And some days I wore the skin off my knees. But you know what, guys? And looking back, it is so clear. God was working. From the first moments I began to pray, even though I couldn't see what he was doing behind the scenes, he was bringing people and circumstances into my father's life to bring him to his knees. And one day, Harry Dent, the good boy scout, the good man, woke up and realized he was a self-righteous man. And he abdicated the throne of his life to Jesus Christ, vowing he would no longer live by Harry's definition of success, but by God's. Oh, my father shocked the political world when he announced he was leaving his legal and political career to go into full-time ministry with my mom to reach all the Harry Dents in the pew who were just like him, attending church, leadership positions, good works, and missing the boat. Absolutely missing the boat. And when my father decided to go into ministry, his friend from the White House, Chuck Colson, and from Watergate, who had also decided to go into ministry, called him up and he said, Harry, I'm so glad to hear that you're going into ministry, but may I give you some advice? Before you go into ministry, you need to get away from the world and study the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and integrate it in to every area of your life. My father took his advice. You'll never guess where he went. Any guesses? Columbia International University, the forbidden of forbidden places. Of course, my husband and I told him all the reasons why he shouldn't, like he'd be a poor church mouse who nibbled off of government cheese, and we gave him that picture of the shack back. <laughs> he deserved it. He kept it in his ministry office for over 25 years. Oh, my husband and I watched as God took the foremost political strategist of his day and literally transformed him into God's kingdom strategist and a man who would walk through doors only God could open, a man who would become everything he forbid his daughter to be, including that gosh, awful missionary, and a man who would work in ministry for 25 years with Billy Graham, with speaking across this world, but particularly in the Transylvania area of Romania, where he helped the underground pastors to come to freedom after communism and plant on the surface. But more importantly, the government, the new government after communism, asked for his help. And he went to them and he said, oh, I'll help you. Not for money, because I didn't have any. I'll help you for the good Romanian people who have suffered so much. But when I help you to do all these things, to put your country back together, I'm doing it in exchange for your people's religious freedom. And they were able to build on the surface after that time without government interference. Yes, my father and I both changed our definition of success, and we learned four keys to kingdom success that I would like to share with you today. Not learn from our successes. Oh no, <laughs> we learn better from our failures, don't we? First of all, if you want to be successful in the kingdom of God, God must have first, I mean first, priority in your life. It is not about asking God to bless your plans, your man-made plans. Get it? Now, my dad and I did that for many years. Five-year plan, 10-year plan. Oh, God, bless our plans and put him back on the shelf. No. 
It's all about him and what he wants to do through you. And his plans are higher. His plans are greater. And we each have a mission to fulfill in life as Christians, whether feeding his sheep or shining his light. It took my dad 50 years to realize that. Number two, if you want to be successful in God's kingdom, you must have that biblical worldview and see things the way God sees things. And as Chuck Colson said, to do that, you've got to study the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and integrate it into every part of your life. You guys are ahead of the game here because that's what you're doing and you're building a foundation for your life, your marriage, your family, your career. Priceless, absolutely priceless in value. This third one I'm going to hit a little bit harder. You must live life from an eternal perspective because this world is not about all you can accumulate because you can't take it with you we must live life with eternity in mind my dad spent 25 years in politics and in military service fighting for the freedoms of this country and that's a high and noble calling we need people to do that but here's the problem we didn't realize because God had to teach us this that he didn't give us our freedoms so that we can achieve the American dream and be wealthy he gave us our freedoms so that we could accomplish the will of God in our lives and be a part of the Great Commission and I'm gonna give you three examples of that today they're gonna to knock your socks off in 1997 I was privileged as a trustee of the International Mission Board of the Southern Baptist Convention to work alongside our medical missionaries in the country of Yemen, not the safest place in the world. And these missionaries ministered to my heart as I walked in their everyday shoes and sensed their dangers. And when a threat came to take us all out, I was ready to run and hide, you know, maybe run back home, you know what I mean? That was my first instinct. But they looked at me and they prayed and they kept on going and they said, Jenny, let, let me explain something to you. I was a little bit young at the time. God holds us in the palm of his hand. And he has us here for a purpose. And if it's his will for us to die a martyr's death for the sake of the gospel, we are willing. Words I would never, never forget. Because several years later, a man influenced by Al-Qaeda snuck onto the hospital campus with a hidden machine gun and killed three of them. They died instantly but just as they warned me God used it to advance the kingdom of God in that country because the people in that province of Yemen loved these missionaries so much they made their caskets with their own hands they lined the street for miles for their funeral procession and the word spread all over the country of Yemen our people loved these people and they were people of God the Christian God our work spread. No missionaries left that country. It was absolutely amazing. But these missionaries lived as though dying is actually gain. How many of you followed the blog? Anyone of Joey and Rory Feek? Did anyone follow Rory and Joey Feek's blog? The husband, Rory, blogged about his wife's journey with cancer. They are country music stars, Christians who were just nominated for a Grammy. And while his wife is going through these horrible stages with cancer and all this bad news and all these things, he's painting a picture of eternity to his followers. And on the day she died, this is what he said. He said, my wife achieved the goal and dream of her life today. She is with her Savior in heaven. He showed his followers it is eternal, eternity that matters. And we're to be living for eternity, although hard for him and his daughter to go through the loss. How many of you followed the worldwide news story of Miriam Ibrahim? Does that ring a bell to anyone? The woman in Sudan who was put in prison, sentenced to 100 lashes, 
and death by hanging and was pregnant at the time because she refused to recant her Christian faith. Here's her picture. Anyone recognize this? Her story went all over the world. Millions of people were praying for her. But God, in this case, was going to use this in a different way. Instead of being martyred, God can use anything he wants to. He took the Italian government to come down to Sudan, and they secured her rescue. And guess where they brought her? To America. To give us a message about standing for our faith. Now, I knew about Joey Feeks and Roy Feeks and their story only because I was treated for the whole past year at the same cancer treatment center that Joey was treated at. And when I had come home from my last rounds of harsh chemo and I could barely lift my head off the pillow, I had been trying to interview Miriam six months before. And I get this message from Miriam, Jeannie, I'm ready for interview. Please call. And Daniel and I need your help. We trust you. And I was like, gosh, I don't know if I can get my head off of the pillow. But I realized her message was important, and I got my head off that pillow. And I called them, and she said, we need help getting our message out to the world. We need a writer to write my story. Can you help us? Well, I knew I wasn't the writer. Don't get me wrong, I'm a writer. But we needed better than me. And my first choice of writer was Cease Murphy, the man who wrote 90 Minutes in Heaven, the Franklin Graham story, the Ben Carson story. I called him up, he'd gone into retirement. But he called back and he said, oh, God has touched my heart. I will come back out of retirement for only that story. And as a few weeks ago, all contracts are signed and Miriam's story is coming to be published and movie producers are already interested. Miriam is here to give us a message that eternity is what matters and we need to be willing to stand for our faith. Amen. Glad to help with it. Fourth, if you want to be successful in the kingdom of God, you must realize that your family is your first and most important mission field. After all, it is the first institution God created. And it is his way to reach the world for Christ. And when you leave this place, you will be going out into a culture, if you haven't noticed, where divorce and cohabitation are the rule of the day, and people are redefining the family to fit their own definition. And you might be the only design of God's true family that some people will ever see. Now, my dad, I mean, he goofed, royally goofed in this area. While he was so busy fighting for the freedoms of our country, he left his family. He was never home. He left his family in shambles. This is what happens a lot in the political life. It's a very demanding career. He didn't put his family with the proper priority. And after his spiritual transformation, he gathers us together, and he says, I am so sorry. And I promise to do better as a husband and father. And God helped him to do that. But what he did was costly, and he wouldn't want anyone to repeat his mistakes. My husband and I have been happily married for 39 years. And that's not bad. Out of 40 years of marriage. But I would tell you, my husband would tell you, this past year, my cancer journey has been the toughest <clears throat> trial of our lives as I got bad news after bad news after bad news and surgery after surgery after surgery and chemo after chemo after chemo not one blade of hair was left on my head I look like a holocaust victim and my husband walked right by my side as we walked through the valley of the shadow of death together and when I was at my lowest moment I would hear this several times a week something like you know what honey I looked out across the United States at all the women out there and you are the most beautiful east of the Mississippi River now frankly I didn't look too hot you know what I mean but the point is it takes that kind of dedication to a marriage 
And if you do not have that kind of dedication, I mean, people will see you in good times and bad times, and they're watching your Christian testimony. You think they're watching more in the good or the bad times? The tough times. Ask the Feeks. Ask the Brants. More people are watching because you are a testimony to Jesus Christ more in tough times than in good times. And don't forget it. These four keys can be summed up in this one sentence. If you desire to be successful in the kingdom of God, you must seek his kingdom first. And your faith, as evidenced by these four keys, must be more than macaroni and cheese. My father and I learned that missions was the heartbeat of God, and we're all to have a part in it. But who's going to want to ask about our faith if it's nothing more than macaroni and cheese? You see, God created us each one of a kind, and he desires to use our gifts and talents for his kingdom, not our own. And you might be that David Platt who radically motivates his flock to be salt and light. He is now our mission board leader. You might be that missionary or mission leader who reaches an unreached people group. And one of the first people we know that reached an unreached people group was Elizabeth Elliot. When she left the comfort with her friends and took her daughter and lived with the Indian tribe that speared her husband and his comrades. And before she died, I was privileged to do an interview with her about her life. And I learned, oh my, she was a radical. And her mission to forgive impacted more than just that Indian tribe. Because God can use anything he wants. And he took a secular magazine, Life magazine, and they sent their top photojournalist to document the story of hunting for the men and finding them speared, and it was on the cover of Life magazine. And then two years later, when Elizabeth and her daughter are living in the jungle with these Indians in a primitive way, that photojournalist came back to document their life. Another cover story. God used that to help propel the modern missionary movement in the 50s and 60s, and we need more radicals like Elizabeth Elliot today. You might be that movie producer, actor, screenwriter, who is part of a faith-based film that brings thousands, maybe millions, to Christ. In a recent interview I did with Devon Franklin, who produced Miracles from Heaven, he said, Jenny, I do not consider Christians to be a niche market. They are a very important market, but they must realize this that when they turn on the TV or select a movie, they are voting. And they must vote their conscience because Hollywood is watching. God is using people across this nation in this field and with the gift of athletics to have a platform and to try to use arts and entertainment to bring America spiritual values and character again. And we need to support what they are doing. You might be that teacher, that educator, that professor, that university president that pours your life into students, a very noble calling. And they say that teachers impact some 3,000 lives in their career. You must realize, as a teacher, you might be the only Jesus some people will ever see. You might be the business executive that has the gift of creating wealth to advance the kingdom of God. And if you show your employees a godly lifestyle and that people are more important than things, then you will be ministering in more than one way, like the men in Hobby Lobby. To them, it's far more than a hobby. You might be that government official that God puts in place like a Daniel to advise a president, like my father. You might be that elected official God puts in place to stand for the freedoms of our country and to make laws in accordance with biblical standards. We need people to be involved, and we need to pray for those people that will throw their name in the hat because it's, it's a tough career. And we all need to be involved in the voting process and voting for biblical values while we still have that opportunity. Francis Schaeffer said this, 
Whoever controls the media controls the culture. Hmm. Pew Research in America shows that 80% of our journalists are self-proclaimed liberals, most of those anti-God. God might be calling you to use your gift of communication to help bring biblical values and truth back to this country. We certainly need people like that. You might be that mother who postpones her career to pour her life into her children. Or the father that turns down a lucrative promotion because it would take him too far away from his responsibilities as a father and a husband. Never underestimate the power of godly parents being involved in their children's lives. David Green said this of Hobby Lobby, as Christians, we are called to be change agents. We are to be used of God to point people to God and let him do the changing. If people are changed, the culture will be changed as well. And God has called each of us to have an impact on the culture in our own area of influence. And remember, Webster says that success is a noun. Oh, I disagree, because life has taught me that success is found by daily bowing on bended knee, surrendering your life to him, and actively being salt and light in this world, and all three of those are verbs. Francesca Battistelli said it this way in her gift of song, and by the way, you might have the gift of song. I noticed many people here today that did. This is what she said. I'm an empty page, I'm an open book, write your story on my heart, come on and make your mark. Author of my hope, maker of the stars, let me be your work of art, come on and write your story on my heart. <laughs> That's not bad for an old woman, huh? All right, the Bible clearly tells us he is the potter, we are the clay. We are his work of art. My dad and I once thought our greatest days were our days in Washington, D.C. and New York, but we both learned that our greatest days came after we bowed on bended knee to serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And as my father was known to say before he passed, nothing is more fulfilling than working in the kingdom of God. And the retirement benefits are literally out of this world. And I want you to remember that. Don't ever forget that because there will come that day when you are exhausted emotionally exhausted from pouring your life into people and Satan will come up and knock on your door and he'll say, oh, let's compare, let's compare. Let's see your colleagues, your family, your friends, your neighbors. Look at what they have to show for their hard work and what have you done? Don't ever forget that although you may have some rewards on this earth, your rewards are exponentially in heaven. Now, I can't close today without one test question. Call me a teacher. I am. That's the way it is. And I have to give you this one test question before you can leave the auditorium to show that you have gotten the gist of my message today. Are you ready? It's a fill in the blank about success. If you want to be successful in God's kingdom, you must seek his kingdom first, put him first, and your faith must be more than... <laughs> Thank you. And when you go to lunch today and you're eating that macaroni and cheese, I hope you'll never look at it the same. And there are my complimentary books that are out on the front if you would like it. Finding True Freedom from the White House to the World. Thank you and God bless.